Today we begin an investigation, a search into the identity of Jesus Christ. As you well know, during his lifetime, Jesus claimed to be nothing less than the very Son of God. And the New Testament writers supported those claims by by describing the miraculous works that Jesus did. So we ask ourselves the question, are they true? Are the Gospels true? Is Jesus who he claimed to be? That's that's the premise that we will investigate as you and I journey through the book of Luke during the next few weeks and actually the next few months. So notice Luke chapter 1 with me this morning. We're going to read just the first four verses. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. I'll put it up on the screen. I trust you bring your Bibles. Let me encourage you to bring your Bible and follow along. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. You follow along with whatever translation you have. Luke 1, 1. Luke says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. If you underline in your Bibles, underline that phrase, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I also have decided to write a, notice once again, a careful account for you. Most honorable or most excellent Theophilus. Notice verse 4, it's the key for our message today. Why did, why, why did Luke write this? He says, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Let me read that again. Luke said, I have written this story, this account, so that you can be certain of everything you were taught. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we approach your word today with reverence, but we realize that it is none other than the very word of God. Father, we're so grateful that we can come to church and have fun, enjoy ourselves. Lift up the name of Jesus Christ, who's the only one that is worthy of worship. Fellowship with one another. Be reminded of the needs that exist around the world and actually have a part in transforming kids' lives for all of eternity. And now, Lord, we pray that as we open up your word, I pray that you would teach us from this passage. God, the next few weeks, the next few months, give us a greater understanding of who Jesus is. And as we understand who he is, give us a greater awe, a greater respect Yes, a greater love for him. God, I pray you'd help us to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And as we do, I pray that you would transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You you might ask this morning, Brian, why investigate Jesus? I mean, we came to church today, all of us probably to some degree believe in Jesus. Why? Why is an investigation necessary? I'll give you a couple of reasons in your notes today. The first is this. We investigate Jesus because there is widespread skepticism and cynicism into the validity of his claims and the authenticity of his miracles. The other night, Mark and I were doing what men like to do. We were sitting relaxing with the TV control in our hand, surfing channels, all right? Going from one channel to the other, we'd watch something for about 30 seconds and hit it and go to the other one, and we were flipping through the channels, and all of a sudden we got to the History Channel, and we stopped because there was a program on the History Channel. It was called something, I forget exactly what it was, but it was talking about the New Testament and the validity of the New Testament and the miracles of Jesus, and Mark's got a Bible. Bible school degree, and I respect say, boy, let's watch this. And as we watched it, our blood began to boil. And, and we got so angri- aggravated that we watched it only for about 10 minutes, and finally Mark said, I'm not watching this, I'm going to my room. 
He was upset. You said, Brian, what were you upset about? These, these Bible scholars, these Bible teachers, these individuals that have PhDs in theology and religion were blowing away the veracity of Scripture. And they were standing up saying, this isn't true and those miracles aren't true. Basically saying that you and I cannot trust the Scriptures that we hold in our hands. We live in a day in which skepticism abounds. Cynicism abounds. You know somebody that does not believe in the validity, the veracity of Jesus Christ. You might work with them. They might be your neighbors. Why, they might live in your same household. How do we respond to them? And how do we make sure that their doubts do not become our doubts? And how do we hold strong in the faith? Several years ago, there was a man by the name of Lee Strobel who was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. Lee, Lee Strobel, according to his own testimony, was a skeptic. And Lee Strobel decided to investigate the validity of Jesus and the gospel. Lee Strobel went on a journey, much like the journey that we are going to take the next few months. In the process, he cross-examined a dozen, a, a dozen experts with tough point-blank questions in search of credible evidence about Jesus of Nazareth. Was he the Son of God? What were Lee Strobel's conclusions? Well, you can read his book. It's called The Case for Christ. What happened to Lee Strobel? Lee Strobel became a believer he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ when he looked at the veracity, the authenticity of the evidence. Lee Strobel walked away saying Jesus was who he claimed to be. And Lee Strobel's life has been forever changed by Jesus Christ and by the power of the gospel. You and I know people who don't believe. We must investigate Jesus so that we are convinced and so that we can share the truth with them. There's a second reason why we investigate Jesus. We investigate him because he is the most fascinating person in the history of the world. So, let me say that again. There ought to be just a huge amen when I say that. But Jesus is the most fascinating person in the history of the world. <laughs> there you go. Contrary to modern television ads, the most interesting person in the world is not the guy from the Dos Equis commercials. All right. It's Jesus Christ. Who else has fed more than 5,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fishes? Who else turned water into wine? Who else walked on the water? Who else do you know that lived a perfect life yet was innocently tried, convicted, and then executed even though he was guilty of nothing? Who else do you know that rose from the dead just as he said he would. Without a doubt, Jesus is the most interesting man in the world, and he is worthy of my search, and he's worthy of your investigation as well. But here's the third reason why we want to investigate Jesus. Because his life story intersects with your life story. You see, Jesus came, I know these are harsh words, but Jesus came to rescue us from the disaster that is our story. We studied that in Romans chapter 3 just a few weeks ago and we saw that at the very best we are depraved. There is nobody that is, does good. There is nobody that is looking for God. There is nobody that is perfect. We were condemned on our way to hell. And then we met Jesus. Our life intersected with his. And today, though we did not have hope, today we have hope. The only reason we have hope, the only reason we have a transformational story is because of him. Jesus is the game changer. Jesus is the life changer. He is the one that makes a difference in your life and in mine. So let me challenge you. Would you go on this journey with us? As we go on this journey through the book of Luke, I promise that you will get to know Jesus better. And I promise you this, if you go on the journey with an open heart, with a sincere heart, with a searching heart, 
I promise you that your life will never be the same. So this morning we jump in and we look at the very first verses, the first four verses. Now, let me just tell you ahead of time, today's sermon is more of a teaching than it is a preaching. Because in order for us to understand who Jesus was and and what the investigator was trying to tell us, it's important for us to know who the investigator was and what was the process of his investigation. And so before we jump into the testimony of the third chapter, or the first, or excuse me, the, before we jump into the testimony of the third gospel, let's examine this man, Luke, and the process of his investigation. So notice the first thing in your notes I wrote is this. Notice the investigator. Who is Luke? Now, now think with me for just a second. It's interesting that Very few people know much about Luke. If I asked you this morning to take out a piece of paper and write down everything you know about Luke, I'd venture to say that you could not write down more than two or three or maybe four things. You say, Brian, how would you know that? Because I did it when I started the series. And and quite frankly, I thought that I knew a lot about Luke. Why? He wrote the third gospel. Let's see. What did I know about him? And I came to realize that I knew very little about him. As a matter of fact, if you were a new Christian reading through the New Testament for the very first time, arriving at the book of Luke, you would wonder, who in the world is this guy? He's not mentioned in the book of Matthew at all. He's not mentioned in the book of Mark at all. As a matter of fact, other than the title of his book, he's not mentioned in the book of Luke at all. He is not mentioned one time. Who is this guy? Let me give you a couple of facts about Luke. First of all, he was not one of the apostles, nor was he an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life. If I ask you beforehand, who was Luke? The natural response we would say is why? He was one of the 12. Oh no, he wasn't one of the 12. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. As a matter of fact, most believe that he was not an eyewitness to the events of Jesus. Many believe that there's a good chance that Luke never met Jesus personally. His name is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Uh, Obviously, apart from the book that bears his name, he's only mentioned three times in the entire New Testament. Let me show you the verses. The first time is Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul is writing about him and Paul says, Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings and so does Demas. The second time he's mentioned is in 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 11 where Paul makes this statement towards the end of his life. He says, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark for he will be helpful to me in the ministry. And the last time he's mentioned is in the book of Philemon. Philemon verse 24, beginning in verse 23, Philemon says, or, yeah, he says, Epaphras, or Paul says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. Go home and read the New Testament this afternoon. Those are the only three times that his name is mentioned in the entire Bible. <laughs> so who was this guy? We know that he was a highly educated physician, After all, remember Paul said in Colossians chapter 4, Luke is the beloved physician. So we know that he was a doctor. Some people believe that possibly he was the personal physician of the Apostle Paul. We know that Paul had a lot of health issues and the Apostle Paul was beaten and many believe that Luke was his personal physician. So to be a doctor in those days and nowadays, man, you got to be highly educated. He was highly educated But we also know that he was highly educated by the language that he used. Now, it's not obvious in English. We realize the New Testament was not written in English. It was written in Greek. And Greek scholars tell us that the Greek that Luke uses is the best of the entire New Testament. 
You ever listen to somebody speak and you walk away thinking, boy, that person's smart. They use big words. They, they formulate them correctly. You know, they conjugate them correctly. That's Luke. I mean, when, when Luke speaks, he speaks with unbelievable precision. He speaks with intelligence. As a matter of fact, these first four verses are written in the style of classical Greek. Now, the rest of the book is written in Koine, which is modern Greek, but as Luke begins this introduction, he uses classical, fancy, intelligent, educated language. So we know that Luke was a highly educated physician. We know that he was a Gentile You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because Luke is not a Hebrew name. Luke is a Greek name. As a matter of fact, Luke struggles using Hebrew. He is much more comfortable in the Gentile vernacular of Greek. He was a Gentile, and catch this, the only non-Jewish writer of the Bible. All the other writers of the Bible were Jewish. Luke is the only Gentile that had the privilege of writing a part of Scripture. His gospel, the the book of Luke, is the first of a two-volume set. Yes, Luke wrote two books in the New Testament. Do you know which one? Think real quick. The second one was the book of Acts. He wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, there's some debate because many believe that these two books were actually one book that Luke sat down and his purpose was to write the, the history of Jesus and to then write the history of the first century church. As a matter of fact, if you go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1 and notice how Luke begins, he begins in the exact same way. Acts 1, 1, he says, In my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach. So the Gospel of Luke is directed to Theophilus and the book of Acts is directed to Theophilus. Here's an interesting point. If I asked you who wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else, I'd venture to say that your answer would not be Luke, but it was Luke. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than the Apostle Paul. Now you might sit back and say, wait a second, Brian, Paul wrote a lot more books than Luke did. Yes, Luke only wrote two books, but the content, the expanse of Luke's books is greater. The amount of verses, the amount of chapters is greater than even that which the Apostle Paul wrote or even that which the Apostle John wrote. Luke is the most prolific writer of the New Testament. He was a traveling companion to the Apostle Paul. Here's an interesting point. We know that Mark was Peter's friend. If you didn't know this, Mark is basically the gospel of Peter because Mark wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus either. And and Mark takes Peter's testimony, and that's what the gospel of Mark is. Luke was Paul's companion. And, and Luke traveled with Paul. As a matter of fact, if you go to the book of Acts from chapter 16 forward, all of the events that happened to the Apostle Paul from Acts chapter 16 forward, Luke was with him. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because the, the pronouns change. When you get to chapter 16, Luke begins to use the pronoun we. We boarded the ship. We traveled here. Luke was the Apostle Paul's companion. He was with him during all of Paul's events, through his final imprisonment in Rome, even up to Paul's final execution. Here's the last thing about Luke that I want you to see today is this. He was a godly man that is a tremendous example for us. There's there's several characteristics that Luke had that that you and I need to have in our lives that we need to emulate as well. You say, Brian, what were they? First of all, Luke was humble. He was extremely humble. As we've already mentioned throughout the 24 chapters of Luke and the 28 chapters of Acts, he never mentions his name not one time. That's remarkable to me because if I was writing a story and I was part of the story, I would put myself into the story. I would say, Paul did this, but so did I, Luke. Luke doesn't do that at all. He doesn't mention his name 
once. Luke had no desire to put himself in the story. He lets the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the theme of his writing, dominate. And Luke realizes that the gospel is not about himself. It's about Jesus. What a great thought. Because quite frankly, your story and my story is not about you or it's not about me. Our story is more about Jesus than it is anything else or anyone else. Luke was an extremely humble man. He elevates Jesus and not himself. What an example for us. It reminds me of the words of John the Baptist in John 3.30 where it says, He must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. What a great example for us. Luke was beloved. It was Paul that called him the beloved physician. That most certainly must have been a tribute to his character as a doctor. He no doubt had a tremendous bedside manner. He was loved by all. He was brave. You said, Brian, how do you read that into the text? Well, very simply, reading through the latter part of the book of Acts, everything that the apostle Paul endured, Luke endured. Rejection, persecution, imprisonment, shipwreck. This guy was one brave guy. He was with Paul each and every step of the way. The last thing I would say is this, he was loyal. He stuck with Paul through the good times and through the bad times. What a loyal friend. What a loyal brother. The the simple truth is this, that Luke is a man of education. He's a man of character. And he's a man of integrity. He's a man that you and I should follow. Even more importantly, he's a man that we should listen to. When Luke speaks, specifically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we need to bend an ear and listen to what Luke says. And so who is the guy? Luke. I've given you some information on him. Notice the second thing, the investigation. What what is the purpose of his writing? Why would Luke have taken the time to, to pen this gospel? Today's text, though, it doesn't tell us much about the man It tells us more about his investigation. Where did Luke get his information from? How did Luke arrive at his conclusions? What was the purpose of writing this, the third account of Jesus' life and death? Let me give you a couple of things in your outline. First is this. He writes to give a detailed history of the life, ministry, and accomplishments of Jesus. Look at the third verse once again. And notice, I asked you to underline these. Notice what Luke says. He says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you. The NESB says it this way. The New American Standard says it this way. It seems fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you. In consecutive order, almost excellent Theophilus. You see, as Luke writes his gospel, this is no simple recitation of what others had written. No, Luke writes a detailed study. Now notice, he tells us what his investigation included, what his study included. First of all, his research included eyewitness accounts. His research included eyewitness accounts. We believe that Luke's gospel was written somewhere around 60 A.D. If you'll remember, Jesus was crucified somewhere around 30 or 33 A.D. So Luke writes his gospel only some 30 years after Jesus was was crucified, buried, and rose again. What does that mean for us? There were still plenty of people alive who saw Jesus. There were plenty of people alive who had heard him teach. Why, there were people alive who had seen him after he rose from the dead. There were people alive that had seen him perform the miracles. Luke says, my research includes testimony of eyewitness accounts. Now, if you're a historian, that's pretty important. If you're going to write an accurate history, you have to hear from the first-hand sources. 
Who would those sources have been? No doubt Luke would have interviewed many of the 12 apostles, Matthew, Peter, and others. Some commentators believe that, that he was able to personally speak with Mary, the mother of Jesus. You say, Brian, how do they arrive at that conclusion? Well, in just a few weeks as we begin the Advent, the Christmas season, we're going to look at Luke's accounts of the virgin birth and the, or, or the conception and the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Luke writes with precise detail as if he talks to somebody who was intimately involved in it. Luke lived in Jerusalem, or he was through Jerusalem very often. It is very possible, if not probable, that Luke sat down and spoke personally with Mary. Can you imagine Luke, the reporter, the investigator, notepad in hand, saying, okay, Mary, tell me how it all went down. Tell me how you became pregnant. What were your thoughts, Mary? What was going through your mind? Luke writes those things in his gospel. He talks about receiving that from eyewitness accounts. The second thing is this. His research included other written sources. Dr. Getz mentioned last week, I'm not sure whether you caught it, but, but we believe that Mark was the very first gospel that was written. We call it Mark in priority. Mark was the first gospel that was written. Matthew was the second gospel that was written. So when Luke sat down to pen his gospels, Mark's account of the life of Jesus was already written, and Matthew's account of Jesus was already written, and Luke would have access to those accounts. And so it is only reasonable to believe that as Luke sat down and began to formulate and to write in a consecutive order the things that took place, it is only natural to assume that he would have used those written accounts. And by the way, no doubt there would have been many other written accounts. Remember, Jesus' death was some 30 years before that. There, there were many other historical accounts that, though not inspired by God, would have been written, and Luke could use those sources, reliable sources, to sit down and write his gospel. It's interesting to note that 60% of the gospel of Mark is found in the gospel of Luke. And so his research included other sources, but here's what I want you to see. His research resulted in a comprehensive study. Although Luke used Matthew and Mark as sources, his gospel is wonderfully unique. As I said a few moments ago, he just didn't sit down and said, okay, let's copy what Matthew wrote, or let's copy what Mark wrote. His copy is unique. Almost half of everything that Luke writes in his gospel is unique to the gospel of Luke. Let me tell you what I'm talking about here. I didn't put these in your notes, but there's some interesting facts. Seven of the 35 miracles that are mentioned in all of the Gospels are only found in the book of Luke. They're not in Matthew, Mark, or John. 19 of the 50 parables that Jesus spoke are only found in the Gospel of Luke. There are, there are, there are 30 events that Luke records in Jesus' life that are not found in any of the other Gospels. Here's the truth. We are indebted to Luke and his research as he sat down and did a thorough study to give us a historical, accurate, inspired accounts as to the life, ministry, and accomplishments of Jesus Christ. This guy was quite an investigator. As a matter of fact, we could call him Sherlock Holmes because this guy got to the bottom of it. He investigated the life of Jesus. He's helped us to know so much about Jesus, but he writes for a second reason. Notice the second thing he writes to give certainty and conviction about the person and message of Jesus. Notice verse 4, he writes to Theophilus and he says this, so you can be certain of the truth in everything you were taught. And he writes to produce conviction. He, he writes to produce certainty to those that would receive it. Now it was written to convince two groups of people. First of all, it was written to convince 
Theophilus. Notice in verse 3, he says, I've decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus. Quite frankly, we're not certain who Theophilus was. We know that he was a man of importance. We know that by the title that Luke uses to address him, most honorable or most excellent Theophilus. Many believe that he was Luke's sponsor, that he was Luke's patron. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? He's the one that paid for Luke to do the study. If he had to travel, he paid Luke's expenses. He paid Luke's salary while Luke did this study. He financed the investigation. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but we do know this. We do know that he was searching for the truth. Because Luke says, Theophilus, I've written this to you so that you can know with absolute certainty about the things we both have been taught. It was written to convince Theophilus, but it was written to convince us as well. You see, there's no doubt Luke knew that others would read his accounts. So his purpose is not just to convince Theophilus, but us as well. I'm reminded of the words of John In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John says this, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles, miraculous signs, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you might continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life by the power of his name. If Luke could stand up in front of us tonight, wouldn't it be good if we could say, we're interviewing Luke this morning. Luke, how come you took the time to go on that investigation? How come you took the time? Luke didn't have a computer. He didn't have an iPad. He didn't have a camera to film all of these things. How come you took the time to do such a detailed investigation? Here's what Luke would say. Because I want you to believe. I want you to know with absolute certainty that Jesus was who he says he was. And the things that the Bible claims that he did, he really did. And I want you to know that Jesus can transform your life. So this morning, it doesn't matter where you are on your journey. If you're here today and you say, Brian, I admit, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I struggle believing some of those things. Luke was written to convince you. If you say, Brian, I'm, I'm not a skeptic, but quite frankly, I'm an unbeliever. I've never given my life to Christ. Luke was written to convict you so that you might fall under conviction. If you say, Brian, I'm a believer, I already believe. Luke was written to encourage you so that we might walk away and we might be stronger in our beliefs and our convictions. So as we close this morning, what is the application As we begin this journey, what is it that that you and I can learn from our study of the Gospel of Luke? There's so many things. I've synthesized it to three. Let me mention three, and we're done today. The first is this. We can learn of Jesus' perfection. We can learn of his perfection. You will see how Jesus responded to followers. As we walk through these stories, you'll see how Jesus responded to antagonists. In every situation you will see and you will be convinced of the fact that Jesus responded without sin. He was the perfect, holy, righteous Son of God. This Sunday study will prove that. Luke says it in the very beginning of his study. In Luke 135, as he reports, as the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, he says this, so the baby born, notice what he says, will be holy. The word holy means set apart from sin. In the very beginning, Luke talks about the perfection of Jesus Christ. We'll learn about his perfection We'll learn about his compassion. As Jesus interacted with sinners, his response was always one of love and compassion. Jesus loved his enemies. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus cared for the poor. As a matter of fact, in his very first public speaking engagement, Jesus is in the synagogue. And and in the synagogue, they gave different people opportunities to stand up. And Jesus stands up and he takes a passage from Isaiah. 
And here's how Jesus characterizes his ministry in Luke 4.18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Jesus had a burden for those in his community that were suffering. What an example for us. As we reach out to our community and we minister to those who are poor and we minister to those who are hurting and we minister to the underprivileged, you know what we're doing? We are being like Jesus. Because that's what Jesus did. As we walk through this book, we're going to learn of the compassion of Jesus Christ. We're going to learn of one final thing. We're going to learn of Jesus' redemption. Here's something that that caught me by surprise. The word salvation, such a a prominent word that we use so commonly to talk about that moment when we trust Christ as our personal Savior, the word salvation is not found one time in the Gospel of Matthew. And I doesn't believe that Matthew didn't believe in it. Matthew just didn't talk about it. The word salvation is not found one time in the book of Mark. Mark doesn't use it at all. The word salvation is only found one time in the Gospel of John. But Luke uses it frequently. Luke uses the word salvation six times in the Gospel of Luke and seven times in the book of Acts. Why? Luke says, I want you to know not only who he was and what he did, but I want you to know what he came to accomplish. And in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, he quotes the word of Jesus, the words of Jesus, where Jesus says, why the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. As we study the book of Luke, we're going to learn of Jesus' redemption. So this morning we begin a journey that's going to take us through Christmas, going to take us through the next several months, and we're going to investigate Jesus. And the goal of my life, you see, I learned from this just like you do, and the goal of my life is I want to know Jesus better. I want to appreciate him more. I I want to fall in love with him more than I love him now. I want my life to be changed as I investigate Jesus. Would you journey with me? And let's allow Jesus to change our lives.